Number 10, Nighttime Operations. On November 15th, 2020, well-known YouTube videographers Tim and Tracy of the UFO Seekers channel took an interesting clip shot from outside the restricted Nevada Test and Training Range, or the NTTR. The new video shows some common NTTR activity, including the camo dude, security personnel, the comings and goings of NTTR employee shuttles, and more interestingly, a lot of air activity over the region, especially at night. The video showed what is most likely a significant nighttime special operations tactical training exercise or capabilities tested at the Nevada Test and Training Range. Most interestingly, the scene appears to be lit by a series of LUU 19 BB infrared airdropped illumination flares for use with night vision devices. The video was 20 minutes long and shows a series of bright lights at low altitude as viewed through their infrared night vision video equipment. Visible in the video are a series of orbiting lights around the brighter descending lights. About specific tests and training activities inside the NTTR don't surface often. The US Air Force published an article on October 24, 2020, saying operations on the Nevada test and training range are continuous. When one operation finishes, another is right behind it, ready to begin. The couple also caught a video of security vehicles and a large bus leaving the gated area distantly adjacent from where the action in their video took place. Now, it's impossible to tell what's actually going on exclusively from the video, but whatever it was, it was big and it looked interesting. All right, so this next photo is of Jerry Freeman uh, taken on a forbidden trip back in 1997. And his head here is supposedly covering the area where the secret S4 hangars are, according to the legendary Bob Lazar. So this guy had uh, quite the adventure uh, close to the forbidden military base. And according to him, he was actually within the restricted area at points, but uh, the exact borders of Area 51 aren't really shared with the public. So what's the story with this guy? Jerry Freeman, an archeologist, decided in 1997 he was going to embark on a seven-day trek into the highly restricted Nevada test site. The funny thing is about this case, though, is that he really had no interest in what most of us would want to see behind the Area 51 curtain. Uh, he was just interested in tracing back the trail of the lost 49ers, pioneers who had traversed the area in 1849. He was in search of an inscription made by one of the pioneers, which was believed to be a Nye Canyon above Papoos Lake on the Nellis Air Force Base, totally off limits. Freeman spent days avoiding security. He slept with nothing but a blanket and the clothes on his back. He traveled very light, too light. He was running out of water by the end. And the funny thing is, is that after this dangerous trek, people were asking him like, so did you see Area 51? What's in there? Where are the UFOs, man? And again, just had no interest in that side of it. So he was like, uh, I think at one point I, I might've seen Area 51. Uh, he'd like climbed on a ridge above Nye Canyon looking down on Papu's Dry Lake, which is just south of Area 51. And he was like, uh, yeah, during the day I didn't see much, but one night I saw some lights. One looked like it was coming from a security vehicle. One was kind of stationary, but it seemed to grow and like shrink in size. Could have been a, a hangar door opening and closing. I don't know, it's an interesting kind of case. Number eight, Codename Hood. A book by Los Angeles Times journalist Annie Jacobson, Area 51, an uncensored history of America's top secret military base, Little Brown, tells the story of the famous site that has spurred tales and rumors of intrigue and cover-ups. Annie dove through thousands of recently declassified documents to reveal what happened in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s at the government-restricted area near Groom Lake, Nevada. In the book, there were some photos, and for this one, Annie said, the black device attached to this balloon in Area 9 of the Nevada test site is a 74 kiloton atomic bomb codenamed Hood, the largest atmospheric nuclear weapon ever exploded in the United States. Standing on a ladder minutes before this photograph was taken on July 5th, 1957, Al O'Donnell put the final touches on the bomb firing system. Area 51 is over the hill to the right of the device, and on the next page and photo, Anne wrote a column of radioactive smoke rises from the Hood bomb. To the right of the mushroom stem, the landscape can be seen on fire. Approximately one hour after the bomb went off, security guard Richard Migas drove through Ground Zero to set up a guard post at the Area 51 guard gate directly over the burning hills. In our seventh spot, we have the Tic Tac UFO. Last year, another UFO was spotted near Area 51. This one was given the name the Tic Tac UFO because of its Tic Tac shape and white or bright appearance. So this spacecraft was caught on footage by a person driving along near Area 51. 
He was driving along the extraterrestrial highway. That's the name given to the highway in Nevada, as a number of UFOs have been seen by drivers while on this route. At first, the driver thought that what he was seeing was just a cloud. When he got closer to it, he realized that it was definitely a craft of some kind. Later on, alien hunter Scott Waring confirmed that the UFO was in fact alien in origin. Also, the area in which he was driving through had a number of wind farms in the area. Turns out that in the past, a lot of UFOs have been spotted around wind farms, and one UFO even crashed into a windmill many years back. Some say this is because aliens are fascinated with human technology. In our sixth spot, we have Stephen Barron. In 2016, UFO hunter Steve Barron captured video and photographic evidence of another alien spacecraft close to Area 51. These were taken near his home in Las Vegas, Nevada, an hour drive from Area 51. Using a night vision camera, Steve head out to Red Rock Canyon to try and capture a UFO. The first couple of hours, there was nothing. Then he saw mysterious weird flashing lights appear over a mountain. He said this in regards to the UFO and its lights, and I quote, First one, then two, then more and more. They put on a spectacular show. I am glad I was patient because the show they put on kept getting better and better. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the CIA spy plane. In 2011, Los Angeles Times journalist Annie Jacobson published a book called Area 51, an uncensored history of America's top secret military base. In the book, she included a number of never before seen photos of the base. The first one I want to show you is of a CIA spy plane. This photo shows an A-12 ox cart hidden behind a barrier at Area 51. This was a top secret plane that was created to reach high speeds and altitudes. During the first three years of testing this plane, everything was kept top secret. In fact, the pilots weren't even allowed to tell their wives what they were working on. On May 24th, 1963, during a test flight, the plane crashed. The pilot, Ken Collins, was fine, but had to eject himself out of the plane. But afterwards, the CIA actually injected him with sodium pentothal, aka truth serum, to then interrogate him after the crash. That's crazy. In our fourth spot, we have the rare photo. So this photo was also featured in Annie Jacobson's book, Area 51, an uncensored history of America's top secret military base. In fact, this is a very rare photo that has never been published before. It was published for the first time in Annie's book, and that's it. This photo is an aerial view of Area 51, taken in 1964. I don't know why it was kept a secret for so long, or how Annie got her hands on it, but she did and decided to share it with the world. Moving on at number three, we have the early U-2 spy planes. In the early 1950s, at the peak of the Cold War, the CIA began to develop planes that they wanted to reach an altitude of 70,000 feet to avoid detection against Soviet radar. This gave birth to the U-2 spy planes that you see here in this picture. This photo was taken in Area 51 in 1956, and pictures a worker standing on the plane's wing. Sadly, at least three pilots lost their lives during test flights, including two at Area 51 and one at an Air Force base in Germany. Coming in at number two, we have Boyd Bushman. Shortly before his death, former Area 51 engineer Boyd Bushman revealed that he encountered aliens while working at Area 51. In a video, Bushman shows a number of mysterious photos to the camera, including one of an alien and a number of photos of the alien's appendages. We have a total of at least 18 that exist and operate with our facility. Now, many people believe that this man is telling the truth. Why? Because he had nothing to gain or lose by sharing his story. Plus, an interrogator with the police studied Boyd's movements and speech pattern during this interview, and he said that it appears as if he's telling the truth. In the interview, he said that Area 51 has at least 18 of these aliens in their facility. He also claims that there are two groups of aliens. One group are called the Wranglers, the others are called the Rustlers. The aliens that are considered Wranglers are friendly and have a better relationship with humans. Rustlers, however, have been known to steal cattle. This is all insane. And in our number one spot today, we have Boyd Bushman and the UFO. During his interview, Boyd Bushman also revealed photos of real UFO spacecrafts that he saw while working at Area 51. Up close and personal, this is a UFO 
which is ready to take off. So that's a close up photo of a UFO spacecraft taking off. Then he also showed a different photo of a UFO spacecraft with its lights turned off. What do you think though? Is Boy telling the truth? Are those real photos of UFOs? Let me know in the comments below. Starting us off at number 10, we have the U-2 spy planes. I know, I know, we just want to get to the alien stuff, but in order to get there, we need to go through the weird human stuff first. So, Area 51 is commonly a place of suspicion, with many thinking that there is proof of aliens and alien tech that lives there. But, once the top secret area was finally recognized in 2013, it was released to the public that it is actually a top secret US Air Force base, where they test tons of new and not yet released aircrafts. One of those aircrafts being the U-2 spy plane. The U-2 the spy plane was first created to keep an eye on the Soviet Union, as the US was worried about a nuclear threat. This plane is known to fly higher than 70,000 feet with a top speed of 805 miles per hour. The idea was that if this plane could soar so high up and at top speeds, it would be less noticeable than other spy planes at the time. It also didn't need to refuel until after 3,000 miles or so. Flight tests began at Area 51 on August 1st, 1955, after a short eight months of construction. The project was known as Project Aquatone. Sounds like a skin treatment. The defense contractor Lockheed Martin built the first plane on a $22 million budget, which is about $207 million today. Even though this plane was crazy expensive, one was actually shot down over Soviet airspace in 1960. Both the pilot and the planes were retrieved, but forced the US to admit that they were spying. So what happened next? Well, the SR-71 Blackbird. That's right, coming in at our number 9 spot, we have the SR-71 Blackbird, the plane that was to make up for the US Air Force's previous failure. Pressure was on the Lockheed Martin team after the U-2 was shot down. They were to create an entire new plane that could not be shot down and fully operational in 20 months. In case you don't know this, that is an extremely difficult task. The Blackbird finally began testing on December 22nd, 1964, and it featured tons of new tech. Aircraft design Kelly Johnson said everything had to be invented. Everything. It was known to many as the perfect spy plane. It could fly up to 80,000 feet high and also had a top speed of 2100 miles per hour. That's a freaking huge jump from the U-2. Many at the time believed that the remains of the Roswell crash in 1947 were actually being kept at Area 51. And don't worry, settle down, I'll get there. But because this was during the Cold War, the CIA actually encouraged the myth that aliens were flying around Area 51 so that the Soviets wouldn't know about their newest weaponized toy. But of course, that wasn't the last of their super cool high tech toys. At number 8 we have the A-12 ox cart. This was another plane that was in development at the same time as the Blackbird and was in the running to be the new recon spy plane, but the Blackbird won on that one. The other difference was that the A-12 ox cart had a crew of one and it was operated by the CIA and not the US Air Force who could fit a crew of two in the Blackbird. Later testing proved that the CIA Air Force didn't want to go through the development of this aircraft, so the A-12 slowly morphed into the Blackbird and even the later plane known as the Interceptor YF-12. The the ox cart, however, was smaller than the Blackbird and faster and could reach higher altitudes, but it was still not the winner in this scenario. It could reach heights of up to 90,000 feet and a top speed of 2208 miles per hour. These craft only operated from 1967 to 68, which is no wonder why most people forget about this one. Or maybe we were forced to forget about it. It's a conspiracy, man. Number seven, the Gorman dogfight. Ah, this one is a classic. A lot of people believe this encounter. This encounter lasted a whopping 27 minutes in the air. A dogfight happened between a veteran World War II fighter pilot named George F. Gorman and a UFO. It was him versus a white orb, and they were both at an extremely high altitude above Fargo, North Dakota. Gorman told a local newspaper following the 1948 event, the experienced pilot said, and I quote, if anyone else else had reported such a thing, I would have thought they were crazy. Captain Ruppelt operated Project Blue Book, a series of studies conducted by the US Air Force between 1947 and 1969, and there's reports of the same dogfight from the ground as well. So yes, there are multiple eyewitnesses for this one. Number six, Project Aquatone. So we think about aircraft evolution over the last, say, 100 years. Well, back in 1955, Area 51 was selected by the CIA as a testing site for the Lockheed U-2. And if you've seen Top Gun Maverick lately, Good on you. Great film. 10 out of 10. But if you've seen it, this will tickle your fancy. The Lockheed U-2 was this high altitude aircraft. It was the top of the line technology and tests were originally conducted over the code name Project Aquatone. Now on June 25th, 2013, the CIA approved the release of declassified documents that
that details, for the first time, officially, the history of the U2 and Oxcard programs in response to a Freedom of Information Act request, just like we're seeing right now with these, you know, UFO videos online. The release of those documents marked the first time that the US government actually acknowledged the existence of Area 51. And since then, we've been waiting around for another big announcement or something. Number five. Virginia sighting. We have to look at some sightings to know what goes on in Area 51, right? If it's spacecrafts or whatever, we've got to look elsewhere for clues. Two UFO sightings were reported to the National UFO Reporting Center in Virginia on April 4th, 2019, quite recent. At 6.48 a.m., an eyewitness claimed to have seen a light blue circular craft darting across the sky in Virginia Beach headed east. So already you're pumped, right? You're jazzed. Aliens confirmed, right? Then seven minutes later, an eyewitness at the Norfolk Naval Station, 23 miles north West claimed to see what resembled a shooting star with a green glow that never faded. This object also moved without noise and disappeared just like that in 10 seconds. There were 2,348 UFO sightings reported throughout the state between 2001 and 2015. Number four, Travis Walton, 1975. This horrifying abduction of a local Arizona forester, Travis Walton, I mean, take it with a grain of salt. On November 5th, 1975, Walton and a number of others from the logging crew, they were working with timber in the national forest, and then while riding in a truck with six other of his coworkers, they allegedly encountered a flying saucer or a saucer-shaped object hovering about 100 feet away in the forest. It was also making a high-pitched buzz, so it was very, you know, something was going on. Walton exited the truck and ran over, curious, and then a beam of light appeared from the craft and blasted him unconscious. The other six men were terrified and they drove away before returning moments later in panic to a now vanished Travis. Walton claims that he woke up in a hospital room observed by three short, bald creatures, aliens. He fought with them until a more human-looking figure led them to another room where he then blacked out again. Walton claimed he remembers nothing else till he found himself awake yet again alongside a highway five days later, naked, clueless of what had just happened. Number three, Brent Lesham Forest, 1980. It was Boxing Day, 1980. The forest lies between the military bases of Bent Waters and Woodbridge. Now at 3 a.m., two military personnel, John Burroughs and Jim Penniston, they both respond to bright lights in the forest. The radios also stopped working, which is not helpful at all in this case. There was a static feeling in the air as well and an odd silence. Now the closer the men got, the more they realized it wasn't one of theirs. Penniston was drawn in and he actually touched the craft. It instantly electrocuted him and apparently downloaded him with odd symbols and star maps into his brain before the craft eventually blasted off again. 24 hours later, the craft returned and Deputy Commander Charles Halt is now witness in the exact same spot. Only this time, there are now three large landing holes in the grass. Years later, Burroughs and Penniston still ask each other and the British government for their medical records from that night because they never received them. Almost 32 years later and still, they've never received anything. Number two, O'Hare Air Airport. The O'Hare Airport incident happened at approximately 4.15 p.m. in broad daylight on November 7th, 2006. The airport received this report that a group of 12 airport employees were all witnessing the same thing. They were all witnessing a metallic saucer-shaped craft hovering still over gate C-17. It was just waiting there for something. The object was spotted by a ramp employee at first, and then it was witnessed by pilots, and then airline management, and then numerous mechanics simultaneously. Air traffic controllers didn't even see the object on radar either. That's the scary part. But in person, sat a completely silent, seven meter wide, dark gray saucer. Several witnesses outside of the airport also saw the object, calling local police and reporting it, of course, because they were terrified. Numerous phone-ins described a disc or a craft hovering above the airport as well for minutes without moving. So everybody saw this, not just airport officials. According to another witness, the object then shot straight up through the clouds at a high speed, leaving just a clear blue hole in the clouds. Number one. Zimbabwe sighting. In 1996, a mass sighting was witnessed by an entire school in broad daylight in Zimbabwe. Yeah, more than 150 students and staff were all present at this point. There have been tons of documentaries surrounding this exact case. Face to face, arm's length with a craft and also alien beings. Yeah, this is a whole cosmic visit apparently. The children, who are now mostly in their 30s and or 40s, are still convinced. They still stand by what they saw. More than 100 students can still remember what they claim to be telepathic warning from the the creatures surrounding our use of technology and the hazards that it has on our planet. So that's cool. Director and writer James Fox documents this infamous interaction in his 2020 documentary, The Phenomenon. Area 51 could be housing UAPs or parts left over from interactions like this one in Zimbabwe back in 
1996. Who knows? Let's delve into the mystical allure of the Issa Grand Shrine in Japan, a pinnacle of spiritual significance in Shintoism. Revered as one of the holiest and most sacred sites, this shrine embodies a tradition steeped in antiquity and mysticism. Uniquely, the Issa Grand Shrine is part of an ancient and ongoing ritual where it is demolished and rebuilt every 20 years, a practice known as Shikinen Sengu. This ritual, deeply embedded in Shinto beliefs, symbolizes the concept of impermanence and renewal, essential to maintaining the purity and power of the shrine. The materials and techniques used for reconstruction are kept traditional, honoring centuries-old craftsmanship. Access to the shrine's innermost sanctum, where the sacred mirror, considered to be one of the three imperial regalia of Japan, is kept, is extraordinarily restricted. This privilege is reserved solely for the shrine's priestess or priest, who is usually a member of the Japanese imperial family, and no other person. Not even the emperor is allowed inside. This level of exclusivity and the profound cultural and religious significance of the shrine make it a fascinating, albeit very mysterious, destination. Next up, we have Room 39 in North Korea. Room 39 in North Korea represents a layer of mystery within an already secretive nation. Believed to be nestled in the heart of a ruling Workers' Party building in Pyongyang, Room 39 is enveloped in mysterious tales and a lot, a lot of speculation. This clandestine entity is rumored to be a linchpin in a network of illegal activities primarily focused on generating foreign currency for the regime. It is said to be involved in a wide array of covert operations ranging from counterfeiting currencies to international insurance fraud and even illicit substance trafficking. The reality of what transpires within its walls is known to only a select few, shrouded in the utmost secrecy. This veil of mystery only compounds the intrigue surrounding Room 39, making it a focal point of international curiosity and speculations about the lengths to which North Korea goes to sustain its economy and fund its leadership's agendas. Next up, we have the Jiangsu National Security Education Museum in China. This museum, located in the heart of Nanjing, represents a unique facet of espionage history, but with a catch. It is strictly off-limits to foreigners. This policy is not just a formality, it is rigorously enforced, underscoring the sensitive nature of the exhibits within. Inside, the museum houses an extensive collection of Chinese espionage equipment and confidential documents, offering an unparalleled glimpse into the shadowy world of spies and secret agents. It's a veritable treasure trove of state secrets, spy gadgets, and covert operations accessible exclusively to Chinese citizens. From cipher machines, used during revolutionary times to modern-day surveillance equipment, the museum provides a comprehensive overview of China's intelligence history. It stands as a testament to the country's very complex relationship with espionage. It is shrouded in mystery and very tightly controlled, mirroring the secretive and exclusive nature of the intelligence world itself. Next up, we have the Woomera Prohibited Area, sprawling across the arid landscape of South Australia. This place stands as one of the world's largest military testing ranges. Covering an area larger than some countries, this vast, desolate expanse is full of secrecy and tightly guarded against public intrusion. Established in the Cold War era, it has been an essential site for testing a wide array of military hardware, ranging from cutting-edge missiles and advanced weaponry to unmanned aerial vehicles and drones. The testing conducted here is crucial for national defense and international collaborations involving partners like the United States. The airspace above Woomera is regularly cleared for testing, creating a temporary no-fly zone that underscores the seriousness of the activities undertaken. Despite its importance, very little is known about the specific projects and experiments conducted within its boundaries, as strict security measures and confidentiality agreements keep these details out of the public eye. This combination of vastness, secrecy, and advanced military technology makes the Woomera prohibited area a fascinating and intimidating locale, far more restricted than most classified sites globally. 
Next up, we have the Boyd Bushman photos. So Boyd Bushman is no longer with us, but he took with him to his grave many tales of the extraterrestrial friends he met as a Lockheed Martin engineer working within Area 51. At least that's what he claimed. In 2007, Bushman was filmed in a video talking with independent aerospace engineer Mark Q. Patterson about his experiences in the restricted area, claiming to have met several aliens, some of whom were hundreds of years old, apparently, and hailed from planet Quintumnia, even said some of these Quintumniums were employees of Area 51. Held up a bunch of photographs. The video became relatively big, but I gotta say, call me crazy, these pictures look not great. That alien looks like it's from Spirit Halloween. Nothing against Spirit Halloween. I go every Halloween, but uh, not the most convincing. I think Boyd knew he was on the outs. He died not long after this interview, and I, I think he wanted to go with a little bit of a prank. Can't blame him. In fact, I respect him for it. Number six, Gabe Zeffman. Gabe Zeffman, a private pilot and amateur photographer, spent Christmas Day 2020 flying his Senesa 150 plane over Area 51 and snapping just over 1,000 photos. He captured stunning visuals of the Nevada Test and Training Range in Area 51, showing a mysterious triangle shape inside an open hangar. The hangar is just south of the main NTTR complex at Area 51, and the object looks large, although it is unclear. It does appear to be the only hangar that's open as well. In the videos of his flights posted on YouTube, Gabe can be heard getting clearance for his route over the restricted area. Now for this particular flight, he had higher quality photography gear that allowed him to capture better photos. So what's in the hangar? Seems like we may never know. Number five, the alien interview. So there's actually footage of this one, so yeah, not really photos, but I mean, isn't video better than a a silly old still photograph anyway. This footage was shown in a 1997 documentary entitled Area 51, The Alien Interview. And the big selling point here was that you were gonna see real footage of Area 51 employees in the S4 facility communicating with an extraterrestrial on camera. The man behind the film, simply known as Victor, narrates through the footage claiming to be former Area 51 employee and whistleblower who copied the footage which was taken in 1989 before setting out to share it with the world. So you don't hear what was actually being said in the video. There's no sound other than the mysterious Victor re relaying the information over the footage, but you do see what looks to be your classic gray alien moving around and opening and closing its mouth. I mean, if it was just a puppet, there was definitely some effort put in here. And by that, I just mean they tried to make it look like it was moving. Number four, closest photos of the base ever. In 2017, Tim and Tracy of the UFO Seekers, who was mentioned before, hiked up the 1.4 mile high Tikaboo Peak, a mountain 25 miles opposite the mysterious military base, in order to capture the closest ever pictures of Area 51. From the peak of this mountain, the duo of UFO hunters used a special telescopic lenses to get the clearest photographs of the buildings and vehicles inside the top secret government site. The Area 51 pictures taken show what looks like a water tower, several complexes and vehicles moving around. Next up we have the UFO. In December of 2019, Nevada resident Steve Barron shared pictures and video of this mysterious object flying over a mountain range close to his home. So whatever the object is, looks big. It's far off in the distance, but it's very noticeable, very bright. Definitely doesn't look like the small specks you get in the sky with satellites. It's super bright again, and it moves in a strange pattern too. It doesn't move at one consistency speed or in one single direction. That's, uh, there's a point where it kind of looks like it could be a satellite. It's moving through the sky in more of a traditional pattern, just straight across. But then it stops, starts moving back in the direction it was coming from, and seems to clip along at good speed too. Like whatever this thing is, it's fast. So I don't know, could be a drone. I suppose, but you be the judge. Number two, the aircraft. A passing commercial satellite seemed to have snapped its top secret next generation combat aircraft on the tarmac of Area 51. Tyler Rogaway of the War Zone was reviewing Planet Lab satellite photos on of the high profile secret site when he spotted something outside the ordinary. The highly classified United States Air Force Nevada testing facility is usually especially careful. Air operations are timed out during the gaps between Earth observation and surveillance 
satellite overpasses. But in this photo, on the taxiway leading through a massive new hangar was a strange shadow. It appears to be a translucent tent. Inside is the outline of what appears to be an unknown type of fighter aircraft. Area 51 is always a popular spot when it comes to publicly available satellite imagery, Tyler wrote. When glancing at daily 3 meter resolution images of the base, we noticed the appearance of a roughly delta shaped blob on the north apron of the large southern hangar. It stayed there between January 26th and 29th, 2022. So what was it? Why did they make this mistake? I don't know. Next up, we have the Area 51 entrance. So a few years back, satellite photos were shared online showing what looked to be a possible entrance to the ever elusive wonder that is Area 51. Someone was cruising around on Google Earth and spotted a road leading to a parking lot by the foothills of a mountain. Now, whatever this road leading to this parking lot uh, was actually built for, it wasn't there back in 1998, where satellite images of the same area showed there to be no road leading to this dead end area with the parking lot. So what's going on? It is pretty strange. Why have all these roads been built leading to a parking lot in seemingly dead end areas by the side of a mountain? There's, there's nothing there. It's not like, you know, they'd park there and then walk all the way back down the road to go somewhere else. No, it seems as if there's a secret tunnel that's been carved into the side of the mountain. I think Bob Lazar said something about uh, some mountain facility in Area 51. As for what's going on in there, your guess is as good as mine. Starting us off with number 10, our secrets kill. In 1994, the US Air Force and the EPA were sued by the widows of Walter Kaza and Robert Frost. The two contractors died while working at Area 51 because they were present when massive quantities of unknown chemicals were being burned in open pits at Groom. The men were never told what the chemicals were, they weren't even allowed to bring gas masks from home or any external equipment, just gloves. They sustained liver, skin, and respiratory injuries, and that soon led to their deaths. Biochemists analyzing the men's biopsies found high levels of industrial toxins in their tissue that are rarely ever seen in humans. Of course, the women lost the case because President Clinton made Area 51 exempt from all environmental disclosure laws and because the government never actually had to reveal what the chemicals were, so the case had insufficient evidence. I find this so unfair, it's like the case of the population of Chernobyl, like the people have to know what they're being exposed to, what they've gone into, so they can make their own informed decisions, you can't just put people's lives on the line. Come on people, let's think. Coming in at number 9 is the employee route. This is one of the most secret places in the world. The contractors there don't even know what materials they're working with. No civilian has ever been inside. Presidents in the past have even requested to know more, like the place is an enigma. And if you thought the employees working there would at least have the real tea, well you're still half wrong again. National security wanted to make 100% sure Area 51's employees wouldn't ever be able to make it to work without a roadmap, so they came up with a plan. Plan. Workers show up to a certain spot in Las Vegas every day and actually get flown into work so they can't remember how to get there. Forget the employees, they had to minimize other people's suspicion and curiosities as well. I mean, employees could easily be followed, so they prevented it completely. Imagine being flown into work every day. Usually I'd say, what a life, but in this case, I'm really not too sure. And to top it all off, all employees are paid in cash only and have to sign their receipt with a fake name since they're part of a black project. At number 8 we have Dreamland. Before the site gained all this fame with Area 51, it was actually called Dreamland. Weird, I know. I only know of one other Dreamland and it's a water park, not an alien conspiracy site. When it was Dreamland, there weren't all these spooky, freaky stories surrounding it. It didn't make people run for the hills like it does now. It was initially called Dreamland because it was meant to be a quiet place where workers could do their job, mind their own business, and not be called out for being aliens. I don't know whose idea it was to call it Dreamland, maybe they thought all their dreams would come true if they got all these military jets, right, or these nuclear weapons, or if they dominated other planets, I don't know. That's why they did all this testing, right? But even then, I still don't see the link between military training and aircraft testing and Dreamland. It's probably Dreamland for someone, but that's definitely not me. 
At number seven, we have the M21 and D21 tag board. Originally known as the Q12, this craft was originally intended to be expendable. The name was later changed to D21 tag board because it was carried on the back of the A12 launch vehicle designated at M21. M stood for mother and D stood for daughter. Then the project was given the name tag board. The D21A was built with titanium and various radar absorbing plastic composites and looked like a stovepipe with a cone in its inlet. The D21 could fly up to speeds of 1700 miles per hour at an altitude of 95,000 feet. It also had a 3,450 mile range before it needed to refuel. That's pretty impressive. The M21 was a two seat version of the A12, but unfortunately these tag team drone planes had a bit of an accident. During a flight on July 30th, 1966, a D21 collided with an M21 on release, destroying both crafts. Both crewmen were able to be ejected in time, falling to the sea, but one of them tragically drowned after his pressure suit leaked. The D21 drone was then later replaced by the KH-11 keyhole reconnaissance satellite. At number six, we have everyone's favorite new toy, drones. Okay, I don't actually mean the US Air Force is testing all those tiny little remote controlled toys that we all buy online, but it is believed that the new hangar being built in the same place where the A-12 ox cart was tested is actually home to a fleet of new unmanned drones that are just waiting to be taken for a test fly. Test drive? You know, it doesn't matter, you get the point. A quartet of modern hangars divided into two separate buildings measuring 90 feet wide are known to be the hangars number 20 to 23 and have been seen going through some pretty major upgrades. Upgrades for what? Probably these drones. These drones are known more professionally as unmanned combat air vehicles, UCAVs for short. Many theorize that the extension and building of this new hangar in the southern ramp area of the base will house large numbers of these craft, keeping them secret and covered up from overhead spies. Inclement weather, and of course our friends above us, the aliens. Coming in at our halfway point at number five, we have trespassing humans. This one should be an obvious one because I'm sure we all remember the Storm Area 51. They can't stop all of us raid back in September of 2019, which definitely didn't go as planned. This was a Facebook event that over 2 million people responded to going, as well as 1.5 million responded with interested. Obviously, because of all the alien rumors, myths, and legends, just about every single day, tourists can be seen trying to get as close as they possibly can to the top secret base. Although, the closest people can get is to the gates, which are still miles away from the actual base. Clearly, at least 2 million people thought that if they all band together, then they could storm past the gate, run a few miles, and reach the ultimate destination of Area 51, emphasis on thought, because on the actual day of the event, only about 150 people showed up and none of them got in. Shocker. I remember the day I came across this event and I laughed my butt off because this was before it made international headlines and I thought it was pretty cool. And I think I even actually responded as going because I thought it was just so freaking funny. But anyway, I never had any real intentions of going because of our number four spot. That's right, coming in at number four, we have Camo Dudes. All over and around Area 51, you can see Camo Dudes guarding the gates, viewpoints, and other mildly unprotected entrance and vantage points. These scary and intimidating Camo Dudes ride around in pure white jeeps, making their presence known to any and all who dare to get close to the top secret base. At the two entrances of Area 51, huge and important signs can be seen stating that there is absolutely no trespassing. And if you have the inkling to do so, let it be known that these camo dudes have clearance to use lethal force. That's right. They will shoot at you, and what's the point in finding the answer to are we alone in the universe if you die immediately right after? Or even dying without the getting the answer. That's even worse. These camo dudes have also been known to have the ability to listen in on whoever is near the gates, and when tourists ask themselves, Hey, uh, I wonder if they, uh, if they will wave to us. They immediately give back a nice little wave, confirming that you are being watched and listened to. So, tread carefully. Starting us off in our top three spot, at number three, we have UFOs. That's right, no duh. Due to all the top secret flight testing that they do in and around the top secret base, many have found secret little vantage points to camp out and see if they spy anything. With some luck, many have reported seeing UFOs and strange lights above the airbase at night, and many don't believe them to be human technology. Not only have there been reports of strange lights and UFOs above the base, but even in the state of Nevada, there have been countless eyewitnesses to strange things and objects in the sky. I mean, that only makes sense as Nevada is home to the extraterrestrial highway, which of course was created due to all the alien lore surrounding the area. But many bars, restaurants, cafes, gift shops, all of those things all go along with the theme and also believe for themselves that aliens are indeed real and are indeed here. At number two, we have spacecrafts. Actual alien spacecrafts. Oh my god. Back in 1942 in Roswell, New Mexico, a devastating crash apparently took place on the night of July 8th. The Roswell Army Airfield reported that 
they recovered a flying disc from the scene, only to retract their statements soon after, reporting that it was actually just a crashed weather balloon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Since this incident, many have gone on record saying that the famous picture of Jesse A. Marcel posing with the weather balloon debris was indeed faked. That was what they were asked to report on after the top secret government officials confiscated the actual crash debris and were never seen of again. It is now popular belief that not only was the craft confiscated and brought into a top secret high government hands, there was also three human shaped bodies. Notice the wording, human shaped but not human. Hmm. Due to all of its top secret mythos, many believe that once Area 51 was built in 1955, that's where all of the evidence from Roswell, New Mexico now rested. Of course, there's no way to prove it unless we get in there, and by the way, I also recently learned that there are even secrets and truths kept from the freaking president. So don't count on getting close to any of that info anytime soon. But wait, back up, Dewey, did you say three human shaped bodies were recovered? Does that mean, yup. Finally coming in at our number one spot and the most shocking and obvious thing on our list is actual aliens. Back in 1995, footage of an alien autopsy supposedly at Area 51 was released thanks to London based video entrepreneur Ray Santilli. This footage caused an international sensation and was shown on television networks all over the world. Santilli later in 2006 admitted that the film was a reconstruction, which <laughs> no duh, but do we really think the government and the men in black would really let the new channels all around the world show an alien autopsy? I don't think so. But that being said, Santilli said the footage was reconstructed, as in that there is actual footage of this autopsy and whoever created this widely released tape was actually recreating an event that actually happened. To the best of my knowledge, there is no hard proof that this footage exists out there, but it wouldn't matter anyway because most of it is supposedly lost. All I know is that three human shaped bodies were recovered from Roswell and that can mean a lot of things. Whether they're at Area 51 or not, I think they're here. Starting off this countdown, we have the secret entrances. Just last year, a man claimed to have found three hidden entrances that lead to Area 51. He discovered this after using Google Earth. He compared images of the base from different time periods. In one particular area in 1998, there seems to be no roads or entrance. Satellite pictures of that same location in 2005, 2010, and 2013 show a road and a dead end with what looks like an entrance and tunnel carved into a mountain. In fact, at the dead end, there appears to be cars parked there. Seems unusual for people to just park there, because what is around for them to do? Wander the barren plain alone? No, they're parking their cars there and then entering Area 51 through this secret entrance. In our ninth spot, we have the alien craft. What I'm about to show you is a leaked video and some photos from Area 51 of an alien spacecraft test. The video features a flying object hovering in the sky and moving in ways that other crafts definitely don't do. This was recorded on May 15, 2017 and then was leaked years later. If this isn't actually a UFO, then what could it be? That's what's baffling people. The way it just moves up and down and side to side that quickly is very strange, especially because of its size. What do you think though? Is this proof that Area 51 has gotten their hands on an alien spacecraft? Moving on to number 8, we have the transportation of a UFO. When this next photo was leaked online, it was met with a number of conspiracy theories. So this is the image of the CIA transporting a large part for one of their top secret projects. In fact, when this was getting transported, the CIA sealed off the entire highway. And I'm sure you can see why this was met with a number of conspiracy theories. Like look at the shape of the thing that they're transporting. That is definitely a UFO or part of a UFO spaceship. Now this is where it gets even more interesting. Somehow a group of bikers made it onto the road. When they were stopped by some soldiers, they asked what they were transporting. And the soldier said they found a UFO up in the mountains. Now apparently he said this jokingly. But who knows? Nestled in the ancient city of Oxum, Ethiopia stands a modest chapel believed to be the final resting place of one of history's greatest relics, the Ark of the Covenant. This sacred chest, as described in the Hebrew Bible, is said to contain these stone tablets of the Ten Commandments given to Moses on Mount Sinai. Shrouded in divine mystery, the Ark's 
presence in this chapel is guarded by a single monk appointed for life. This guardian, sworn by a vow of silence and seclusion, is the sole human allowed to gaze upon the Ark, making this one of the most restricted religious sites on the planet. This strict access and secretive nature of the chapel's contents have imbued it with a profound sense of reverence and intrigue. Pilgrims and tourists may visit the compound, but the chapel itself remains a tantalizing mystery, its secrets preserved within its unassuming walls. The blend of myth, religion, and historical significance surrounding the Ark continues to captivate the imagination of believers and skeptics alike, making the Chapel of the Ark of the Covenant a unique and mysterious site in the tapestry of human history. Moving on down, we have the Heard Island Volcano. Heard Island, situated in the sub-Antarctic, is one of the most remote and inhospitable places on Earth. Dominated by the active volcano Big Ben, the island presents a landscape of dramatic natural beauty and daunting extremes. The harsh climate, characterized by persistent cold, fierce winds, and heavy snowfall, renders access to this isolated island almost impossible. Besides its challenging geography, Heard Island is designated as a protected nature reserve, emphasizing conservation and scientific study while strictly limiting human interference. This combination of natural barriers and legal protection ensures that Heard Island remains one of the least disturbed ecosystems on the planet, a pristine sanctuary for wildlife, and a natural laboratory for scientists studying climate change and volcanic activity. Next up, we have the Royal Bedroom in the United Kingdom. Located in the heart of Buckingham Palace, the Queen's Bedroom, well, I suppose it's now the King's Bedroom, epitomizes exclusivity and is undeniably one of the most restricted rooms in the entire United Kingdom. This room, steeped in royal history, is a sanctuary for the reigning monarch, filled with priceless artifacts and personal treasures. Its notoriety peaked in 1982 when an intruder, Michael Fagan, shockingly made it past palace security and into the room, an unprecedented breach that shook the foundations of royal security. This the incident prompted a massive overhaul of palace security protocols, of course, transforming the bedroom into a veritable fortress within Buckingham Palace. Access to this room is now more tightly controlled than ever, reserved for a select few, and guarded with the highest levels of security, ensuring that such a breach remains a once-in-a-lifetime occurrence. Moving on, we have Area 122. Area 122, ensconced within the Antarctic Treaty's no-go zones, lies secluded on an island in the Enderby Land, a remote part of Antarctica known for its harsh and unforgiving climate. This area is designated as a specially protected zone, aimed at preserving its unique and fragile ecosystem. It's a sanctuary for an array of polar wildlife, including species that are not found anywhere else on the planet. The strict restrictions in place mean that access is extremely limited, with tourists and even scientists requiring special permits to visit. These permits are seldom granted, ensuring that human impact on the area's pristine environment is kept to an absolute minimum. The isolation and protection of Area 122 make it one of the most intriguing and least disturbed natural areas on Earth, a true example of untouched wilderness. Next up, we have the Granite Mountain Records Vault. Owned by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Granite Mountain Records Vault is an awe-inspiring facility carved deep into a mountainside near Salt Lake City, Utah. This massive vault, constructed in the 1960s, is a fortress designated to withstand natural disasters and nuclear attacks. Its primary purpose is to house and protect a vast collection of genealogical and historical records, including millions of microfilm reels containing family history and vital records from all over the world. The security measures surrounding the vault are extraordinary, featuring state-of-the-art technology and rigorous protocols to ensure the preservation and protection of these invaluable records. The public's access to the vault itself is extremely limited, with the church maintaining strict control over who can enter the facility. The secrecy and the critical nature of the documents stored within add to the vault's mystique, making it a topic of fascination and intrigue among both genealogists and just the general public. 
Next up we have Porton Down. A British research facility located in Wiltshire, Porton Down is a hub of scientific inquiry dedicated to the study of chemical and biological weapons. Established during the First World War, it has since been at the forefront of research in these fields. The activities and experiments conducted at Porton Down are of the highest classification, covered in secrecy and subject to strict government oversight. This veil of mystery has made the facility a magnet for conspiracy theories and controversies over the years. It has been associated with everything from unethical human testing to the development of advanced undisclosed weaponry. Despite its notoriety, Porton Down plays a crucial role in national defense, helping the UK to understand and defend against chemical and biological threats. However, the exact nature of much of its research remains a closely guarded secret, adding to its mysterious and somewhat ominous reputation. Starting our list off at Number 10, Dark History. This secret base in the Nevada desert acts as the US military hub for spatial engineering. And, you know, possibly, hopefully, some reverse engineering for some alien crafts. The area is named after the geological grid of the desert. The area gained notoriety, of course, in the early 90s, with numerous claims that workers had worked on alien aircraft and even heard of harboring alien creatures underground. The entire premises is fenced off with signs saying no photography allowed, and also use of dead force is authorized. So whatever they're hiding here, it's mostly military, hopefully with a little splash of ET. The base has been a testing facility for the Air Force and remains one of the most highly secured and secretive bases in America. Number nine. Tickaboo Peak. Say you're watching this video and you want something, right? What's the closest you can legally get to Area 51, right? What's the only way you can possibly see footage of a little alien ship coming and or going? Well, you gotta go to Tickaboo Peak, that's how. Located right in the middle of the Nevada desert, Area 51, of course, is hard to see. This peak could help that problem. Bob Lazar, back in 1989, he spoke out to news outlets explaining how he used to work in Area 51, specifically on UFOs using anti-gravity technology. With this peak being just 26 miles away from the top secret base, you might just see a test flight or two from the bushes, just like Bob did, right? Number eight, they can't stop all of us. Back in the 1950s, the public wanted answers as well. It was June 17th, 1959. The Reno Evening Gazette published a story with the headline reading, more flying objects seen in Clark Sky. More? What'd I miss? More flying objects? Then the paper even went on to describe how Sergeant Wayne Anderson, a local sheriff, was one of many locals that spotted what the paper described as an object bright green in color and descending towards the earth at a speed too great to be an airplane. Yeah, like a meteor, I guess. I don't know, that's terrifying. What could they possibly be talking about? The filling on number seven slot is the landing strip, and we can thank Google Earth Images for this one. Back in 2016, it revealed a strange mile-long landing strip located in Area 6, which is about 12 miles northeast of Area 51. There's also a cluster of hangars at the end of the runway, which is quite odd, and if you don't know what a hangar is, it's basically a building that houses aircrafts. No one knows what's being tested there and why the hell they have a mile long runway. It looks sus, and based on my previous video about what the government is hiding in Area 51, this is the fully functional alien airport I was talking about. Check that video out if you haven't already. Now at number six is Paradise Ranch. So of course there are a number of employees that work at Area 51, and regardless of how high up you were or how much you enjoyed your job, living in the middle of nowhere in the desert is boring. During its heyday when it was a testing site for the U-2 aircraft, an engineer called Kelly Johnson tried to rebrand the area to try and convince more government workers to move there with their families, so he came up with Paradise Ranch. Far from paradise, it was actually just an area filled with rows of trailers for families to live in. That is literally it. No amenities even, I mean at least build a grocery store or a pool. I don't know how they named it Paradise Ranch, that's the biggest fake news if you ask me. And either way, clearly the ghost town trailer area remained a ghost town trailer area. Even the picture of it just gives me the creeps. Coming in at number 5 is the picture. There are barely any aerial pictures of Area 51 at all, and in 1974, astronauts on Skylab 4 were taking pictures of Earth for a larger project, and they happened to take a picture of Area 51. Honestly, you can't even see anything in the picture but the lake and terrain, but soon after a memo went around to them saying they had specific instructions to not do this and that this was the only location which had such an instruction. They want to keep this so under wraps, the CIA considers Area 51 to be the most sensitive spot on earth. So apparently now we can't even take pictures of it from space. 
I mean, can the CIA control what we do in space? I, I, I don't think so. At number 4 is The Fire. Most of you know Tom DeLonge as the lead singer of Blink 182, but what you may not know is that he's now an alien hunter. A few years ago, he went camping near Area 51 and things got real. During one night, he woke up at around 3 am and his body felt weird. It felt like static electricity was coursing through his body, and when he finally opened his eyes, he realized at least his fire was still going, but there also seemed to be noises coming from outside his tent. And it wasn't just one sound, it sounded like it was coming from 20 people. Immediately he was thinking right I'm about to get abducted, here they are, they're not gonna hurt me, they're just talking to He tried to listen in on what they were saying but he coincidentally passed out and woke up to find he had no idea what had happened in the last 3 hours. And having done a ton of research on the topic, Tom knew this chatter was involved in every alien contact or abduction story so I mean he was this close. Filling our number 3 slot is the battle and hold on because it's definitely not the battle you're thinking of. The Sheehan family has owned Groom Mine which is a segment of Area 51 for more than 125 years. The US Air Force has been trying to buy the land off them for a very long time, offering them $5.2 million for more than 400 acres of land. They're adamant on kicking them out because even though they've been escorting the family into the space for decades, they can no longer ensure their safety. The base runs 24 7 and sometimes they even cancel missions when the family comes out, which stop being financially viable. On the other side, the family claimed it's not the tests that pose a threat, it's the military themselves. Bullets were even fired around their property in the 40s in an attempt to get them to leave. Family members have even been held at gunpoint on their own property which the air force denies and the family even tried to sue them but ran out of money. They no longer own the land that generations had worked so hard to obtain and I think that puts into perspective that when area 51 is concerned anything goes. Now at number 2 is the humming. Back in 1965, Charlie Arendelle was working as a security guard at a mine near Area 51 and on two consecutive nights he was told to shoot anything he saw on site. Him and a few other guards were driven to another airstrip and told to guard it. The first night they all heard a weird almost muted humming sound for half an hour and when the sound stopped their shifts ended as well. But as they were leaving they saw a huge circular camouflage tent on the runway surrounded by armed troops with their backs to it. The next night they heard the sound again but this time the tent was nowhere to be found. Now I can't confirm what Charlie saw because I wasn't there but I feel like he was bussed to the mile long airstrip also known as the functioning alien airport and was told to protect the vessel as well as potentially kill anyone or anything that comes off of it. And finally at number 1 is the BBC invasion. Breaking into area 51 can end up in many ways. Number 1 the camo dudes can just shoot you, number 2 you can get fined for a thousand dollars and go to jail for six months or three they sacrifice you to the aliens because you've seen too much. Never thought jail would sound good until now. Either way this team of journalists from BBC learned this the hard way when in 2012 they broke into the site looking for a juicy story. Anything for the team my friends. After filming for around 30 minutes one of the crewmen knocked on a door and eight camo dudes which is their official name by the way I'm actually not bullshit came out with assault rifles and forced the crew to the ground. They all had to lie face down with guns to their backs for 3 hours until the sheriff came. All their phones, film equipment, microphones, everything were taken away from them and that's not even the worst part. Amongst the many threats the crew received, one was exceptionally scary. Son, we could make you disappear and your body will never be found. And I honestly don't doubt they could do that for a second. Forget military experiments or covert aircraft. The sites will uncover in part 2 hint at something more profound. Ancient relics, mind-bending research, even gateways to other dimensions. Whispers surround these banned locations. If the truth got out, it could shatter our understanding of history, science, and even the nature of reality itself. Imagine a place so dangerous even the bravest dare not venture. Welcome my friends to Room 39 in North Korea, a location veiled in secrecy and whispered about in hushed tones. This is not your average room. It's not a place where you'd find a cozy bed or a welcoming heart. No, Room 39 is a place of shadows, where the line between fact and fiction becomes blurred, where the unexplainable happens. This enigmatic room is rumored to be connected to a myriad of illegal activities, from counterfeiting $100 bills to producing controlled substances. But what's most chilling is the wall of silence that surrounds it. The North Korean government has never officially acknowledged its existence, yet it's said to be a vital part of the country's economy. 
an economic powerhouse operating in the shadows. Imagine a place so secretive that no outsider has ever set foot inside. Only a select few, hand-picked for their loyalty, are allowed access. The rest of us are left to speculate and wonder about what truly goes on behind those closed doors. The mystery of Room 39 is like a puzzle, a riddle wrapped in an enigma. Some say it's a hub of nefarious activities, a breeding ground for corruption. Others believe it's a place of innovation, where scientists work tirelessly to advance North Korea's technological prowess. But the truth, my friends, remains elusive. The speculation surrounding Room 39 is as vast as the night sky. It's a place that stirs the imagination, a place that invites us to question, to probe, to seek out the truth. It's a place that reminds us of the power of the unknown, of the allure, of the forbidden. And yet, despite the danger, despite the mystery, there's something oddly captivating about Room 39. It's a place that draws us in, a place that pulls at the strings of our curiosity, a place that compels us to venture into the unknown. But this is just the beginning of our journey into the forbidden. Now cast your mind to an island where death lurks around every corner. Tucked away in the shimmering waters off the coast of Brazil lies a seemingly paradisiacal island, known to locals as Ilha da Queimada Grande. But don't let its tropical allure fool you. This is no ordinary island. It's better known by a far more ominous name, Snake Island. Picture this, an island roughly the size of 23 football fields, home to an estimated 4,000 of the world's deadliest snake species, the golden lancehead viper. These slithering predators cling to every inch of the landscape, from the forest floor to the highest treetops, their venom so potent that it can melt human flesh. The island's high concentration of deadly snakes is not by chance. Separated from the mainland around 11,000 years ago, the snakes evolved in isolation. Without ground predators, their population exploded and the competition for food turned them into the deadly creatures they are today. The Brazilian government, recognizing the inherent danger, has declared this island off-limits to the public. Only a select few, including scientists and the military, are granted access and even then they must adhere to strict safety protocols. It's said that there is one snake for every square meter on the island. One wrong step could spell instant death. Stories of past encounters paint a chilling picture. From a fisherman who strayed onto the island in search of bananas, only to be found days later in his boat, lifeless and covered in snake bites, to the island's only known inhabitant, a lighthouse keeper and his family who met a gruesome end. This is no place for the faint-hearted. It's a chilling reminder of how deadly nature can be when left to its own devices. A place where danger is the only constant, and survival is never guaranteed. So think twice before planning your next tropical getaway. Have you ever wondered where humanity's last hope lies in case of an apocalypse? Well, let me take you on a wild ride to the far north of the world. Tucked away in the frozen tundra of Norway lies a highly secure facility known as the Svalbard Global Seed Vault. It's not your typical vault. It's a veritable ark for plants. Concealed within the icy confines of the Arctic Circle, this vault is a lifeline for future generations. This vault, my friends, is more than just a storage unit. It is a safeguard against the extinction of the world's most precious resource, food. It's a storehouse of genetic diversity, a backup for the planet's agricultural heritage. Inside, it holds a collection of over a million seed samples from around the world. From wheat and rice to the rarest of herbs, it's all there preserved in sub-zero temperatures, ready to spring back to life when needed. Why, you might ask, is such a place so heavily guarded? Well, the answer is simple. The seeds within this vault represent the survival of humanity. In the event of a global disaster, be it nuclear war, pandemic, or climate catastrophe, these seeds could be the key to our survival. They are our insurance policy, our last line of defense against a world devoid of the plants we rely on for sustenance. But it's not just about survival. It's about preserving the rich biodiversity of our planet. Each seed in this vault carries with it a story, a piece of our past, and a promise for the future. It's a reminder of the diversity that once flourished on our planet and a beacon of hope for its restoration. Yet this vault isn't just a symbol of hope. It's a warning, a stark reminder of the threats that our planet and our species face. It's a testament to our foresight our will to endure, and our commitment to preserving life on Earth. 
So, next time you're biting into an apple, remember that its very existence might be due to a seed that once lay frozen in the depths of the Svalbard vault. It's not just seeds they're protecting, it's our future. Ever heard of a town where the only residents are ghosts of the past? Tucked away in the romantic canals of Italy lies a place that is anything but romantic. A place where echoes of a chilling past still linger. Welcome to Povelia, a tiny island nestled between Venice and Lido in the Venetian lagoon. A place that once teemed with life, now abandoned, its silence only broken by whispers of its haunting history. Povelia, in its heyday, served as a bustling trade center. But as the Black Death swept across Europe in the 14th century, the island was transformed into a nightmarish quarantine station. Thousands of victims, sick and dying, were sent here, their cries of agony echoing through the narrow streets. But the island's tale of terror doesn't end there. In the early 20th century, a mental hospital was built here. Its chief doctor, it said, conducted horrifying experiments on the patients. The doctor himself, driven mad by the island's eerie atmosphere, ended his life by jumping from the hospital's bell tower. Today, Povelia stands desolate, its buildings crumbling, its streets empty. The only sounds one might hear are the rustling leaves, the lapping waves, and perhaps, if you listen closely, the faint wails of the spirits that some say still inhabit this forsaken place. The Italian government, recognizing the island's chilling past, has deemed Povelia off-limits to the public. The locals, too, avoid it their superstitions keeping them at bay. They believe the island is cursed, haunted by the souls of those who met their tragic ends here. Paveglia, with its haunting history and eerie atmosphere, is a stark reminder of the darker chapters of our past. It's a place where the line between the living and the dead seems blurred, a place where the echoes of a chilling past still linger. Some places are better left alone, don't you think? Next, we ascend to a place where the air is thin and the danger is palpable. Today, we're journeying to the serene yet intimidating landscapes of Bhutan. There lies a majestic peak, a testament to nature's awe-inspiring power and beauty. This is Gangkar Puensum, the highest unclimbed mountain in the world. Now you might ask, why has no one scaled this towering giant? The answer lies not only in the physical challenge, but also in the spiritual realm. You see, Bhutan, a country deeply rooted in Buddhist tradition, views these mountains not just as geographical features, but as sacred abodes of the divine. The locals believe that deities dwell on these peaks, and to disturb them would be to invite disaster. In the year 1994, Bhutan officially banned mountaineering. They did so out of respect for these local beliefs and to preserve the sanctity of these mountains. But the ban came after an unsuccessful attempt by a British expedition in 1986 to conquer Gangkar Puensum. The expedition faced inexplicable difficulties and was forced to retreat, further cementing the mountain's reputation as a forbidden zone. Since then, Gangkar Puensum has remained untouched, standing tall and proud against the sky, a symbol of the sacred that man has chosen to respect rather than challenge. It's a stark reminder that some things are best left alone not out of fear, but out of reverence. Despite the allure of being the first to conquer this peak, climbers have heeded the ban. They've understood that the thrill of victory would be short-lived compared to the long-standing respect for cultural beliefs and the preservation of nature's sanctity. Here on Gangkar Puensum, we learn a valuable lesson. We learn that not all challenges are meant to be conquered. Some are meant to be revered, to be viewed from a distance, to be respected. Sometimes it's best to leave the sacred untouched. Finally, we dive into a lake that holds more than just water. A seemingly innocuous body of water nestled in the heart of Russia, Lake Karachay, holds a secret far more chilling than any ghost story. This is not your average lake. It's a deadly reservoir of invisible threats, a silent killer lurking in the shadows of the Ural Mountains. Now you might be wondering, what could possibly make a lake so deadly? The answer lies in its history. During the Cold War, Lake Karachay was used as a dumping ground for radioactive waste. Over the years, it has accumulated lethal levels of radiation, making it one of the most hazardous places on the planet. The radiation levels are so high that standing on the shores of Lake Karachay for just an hour could kill a human. And mind you, this isn't a slow, drawn-out death. It's swift and brutal. The radiation rapidly destroys cells, leading to severe radiation sickness and, ultimately, death. But here's the truly terrifying part. You can't see it, you can't smell it, and you can't taste it. 
Radiation is an invisible killer. It's there, in the air you breathe, the ground you tread on, and the water that laps against the shores of the lake. One moment you're admiring the serene beauty of the landscape, and the next, you're caught in a deadly trap with no way out. And the lake isn't just lethal to humans. It's a death sentence for any living creature that dares to venture too close. Birds that fly over the lake, animals that drink from its waters, even the plants that grow on its shores, all are subject to the deadly radiation. So, why is Lake Karache still there, you ask? Well, it's simply too dangerous to clean up. Any attempt to drain the lake or remove the radioactive material could potentially release even more radiation into the environment. Who knew something as serene as a lake could hold such a deadly secret? The chilling tale of Lake Karachai is a stark reminder that not all threats are visible and not all waters are safe to tread. If you enjoyed this video about secretive locations around the world, then you have to check out this video next. It's about how to protect your security and be have your computer be as airtight as these locations. Click the video now to find out more.